Hi, friends, and welcome to Costuming in Color. We're a YouTube show dedicated to showcasing amazing costumers of color and the people that support them. I'm Gigi, all history, everything, basically. You got, you guys already know me. I'm Noelle. I do historical and cosplay. Today, we are talking to Yinzi of Torn and Polished. Welcome to the show, Yinzi. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. We are so glad to have you. Uh, but before we get into it, house rules. The first rule of costuming in color is that you tell everyone about costuming in color, right? Yes. That way, even if you don't have people of color in your local groups, you can get to know some in our global community. The second rule is that kindness matters. Aside from that, there are no rules. So now let's get into it. Yenzi, where are you from and do you still live there? Yes. So I actually grew up in the suburbs of London. I am a British Chinese individual who studied in Toronto for four years. And um, now I am currently uh, living in Hertfordshire. For those of you who are Jane Austen fans, where the Bennett sisters lived. So yeah, um, basically I've been loving it there. I live in a market town and really easy access to London. And it's just got such lovely little um, stalls. I feel like Belle walking around in her little quiet village in Beauty and the Beast. And, uh, you know, you've got butchers, you've got florists, you've got grocers. It's just a magical place. And I absolutely love it here. I'm currently, however, in uh, Toronto to see some relatives as a vacation. So yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What is your favorite thing about where you live? So I definitely say England as a whole um, offers so much heritage and an overwhelming number of free galleries, museums and historic sites. And I absolutely love history and art. So the UK has so much of it. So I think definitely top of my list is being able to take advantage of some heritage groups such as National Trust and English Heritage. They're two organisations that protect and preserve beautiful places, whether they're estate houses or the countryside. And um, one of the things that I absolutely love doing is going to an estate, going for a hike, and then finishing up with a lovely heritage pub that's often hundreds of years old. And if you're in London, go check out the Spaniards Inn, because um, it was where Bram Stoker got some inspiration for Dracula. Um, and uh, yeah, it's also really, really nice. And it does an amazing Sunday roast. So. Oh, that's really good to know. I find myself in London pretty often so I'm oh, really? about that yeah you'll better hit me up so I you know, I'll, I'll make the trip there. down to come say hi or maybe I'll come see where you are <laughs> yeah that'll be lovely <laughs> so before I ask my next question Hartford Hereford no it wasn't Hartford sure it was it is Hartford chair it is Hartford okay but, but from my fair lady yeah she was about Hartford okay it was just she says like Hartford Hereford and Hampshire hurricanes hardly ever happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Hartford yeah. is in Hertfordshire. Oh, so Hartford is a town in Hertfordshire. So it is very nice. You should check it out. Okay, is the so, yeah. shire is it is the shire like shire and therefore yes. like its sister? <laughs> So yeah, it's a county in England and we don't have like the sexiest reputation in terms of like there are other counties that are like, you know, um, you know, quite, quite, quite fancy like Gloucestershire and Wiltshire and so on. Our, our tagline is the county of opportunity. <laughs> which is like such a random tagline um but it is a lovely place and there's a lot of heritage lots of lovely estates and we're also very close to like other counties such as um uh, Essex and Cambridgeshire and so on so you can if you've got a car you can explore quite a, a lot of places we've got lovely little villages with a lot of heritage so um if you look out for some blue clerks you can find some amazing individuals who've lived all over the place I didn't realize for example that the founder one of the founders of modern China Sun Yat-sen actually stayed in Hertfordshire and my husband were just driving along and we saw like a blue plaque and it was like this beautiful little cottage and it was like Sun Yat-sen the founder of modern China stayed here and we were like 
wow okay <laughs> so yeah it's a really cool place where you know it doesn't get a big rep in terms of like tourism like the other counties do but I I love Hertfordshire and uh, we've got beautiful forests we've also got um, some incredible estates and um, we also have um, a real nice sort of um a uh, selection of like pubs and uh, really fun little county fairs and things like that. So I'd recommend visiting. Yeah. And you have opportunity to. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we have a city in California called the city of commerce and the city of industry. And I'm just like, who named these? <laughs> I know. It's, it's a very weird tagline. No, it's so, not even a tagline. That's the name of the city. The- Oh, really? Yes, it's oh, called wow. Industry and Commerce. <laughs> oh, wow. There are two cities. One is Industry, one is Commerce, and they're right next to each other, which is actually useful. <laughs> oh, interesting. And I assume that industry has a lot of industry and commerce has a lot of commerce? Or Nobody knows what really happens in those cities, but there's not a lot of people that live in them. I can tell you that. So probably, yes. <laughs> oh, I see. Interesting. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you learn something new every day. This is what costume in color is actually all about, spreading yeah. those facts. <laughs> so yeah. So speaking of learning something, I want to know what is your Instagram handle and why did you choose it? Yeah. So when I was studying in Toronto, actually, um, I used to run a style blog with one of my good friends and she actually came up with the name. And uh, eventually, after a few years of doing it, we sort of decided to go our separate ways, especially because I moved back to the UK and it was a bit hard to kind of maintain from two different countries. So I ended up inheriting the name. I was very lucky in that sense because I quite like the name. Um, But essentially, the origin of it was really to show that you can be you know two opposing ends all at the same time and essentially um the torn element kind of like exemplifies the sort of more tomboyish style that we espoused you know ripped jeans all that sort of cool sort of thing but also that we could be polished in our little fairy tale gowns and things like that so it was sort of a harmonization of those two sides to our style and um what happened after we sort of broke away from our um, uh, sort of partnership is that I've sort of gone into a completely tangential journey, which doesn't necessarily work that well with the name, but it still sort of connects with the name, which is, I just love, you know, getting involved in so many different things and experiencing different sides of my creativity, whether it's sort of wild or it's sort of more put together. I so, feel like your name fits pretty well for like the oh, photography really? that's on your your gram. Oh, thank you. That's a massive compliment. So yeah, yeah basically I'm now knee deep in the fairy tale and fantasy world. And yes, yeah, so you know, there's elements where it's a bit more sort of torn, so to speak, where it's a bit wilder and mm-hmm. you know, I'm sort of running through like a field. And then you have the more polished elements where I've got like really impeccably done hair, not usually by me, it's usually by an amazing hairstylist that I work with called Nettie. And uh, you know, in a sort of more sort of put together gown or put together the outfit so it really is sort of celebrating the different sides to 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 my style and to my aesthetic as well as to potentially the way that I do things in my creative life as well for example I get involved in sort of crafting things I get involved in self-portraiture I get involved in modeling and I also get involved in uh from time to time sort of coming up with a shoot concept and running with it with a big team so you know all of those different elements might incorporate elements that are quite wild and um out there (laughs) and then some that are more sort of thematically traditional so it's fun to get a a bit of everything in there so my grid is a bit chaotic (laughs) but that's how I like it so oh man I think it's like aesthetic af like it, it is very it, to me it looks really polished because it's very um you know it's like thematically maybe a little like di- each picture is different from each other but like the overall scheme of like I'm gonna produce amazing photography somehow of myself which I am still trying to figure out how that happens uh oh, yeah it, it's very like it's it's very on theme all the time even though it's all different kinds of stuff. Well, that is 
massive so thank you so much I really appreciate it because if there is some sort of vibe that it's all linked in some way that is brilliant to hear so thank you for that and uh, you know likewise all of your work is incredible and impeccable so I'm going to take that compliment and run with it so thank you <laughs> so yeah did you want to explain a little bit about like the theme of your page yeah, I mean, I don't think I've necessarily thought out the theme of my page. It's just that I'm endlessly curious and I'm endlessly excited about pretty much everything I can get my hands on if it's got a fantastical element. So I love history. I love, you know, badass women with sort of badass agendas. Sorry to <laughs> abuse and use that word over overly. Um, but, you know, um, I love getting into different roles in my imagery, whether it's sort of femme fatales or warrior women or, you know, really trying to invent my own narratives. It's something that I feel passionate about because I think, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't really see much representation. And, you know, one of the biggest things for me as a Chinese person living in Britain was, you know, when the Disney movie Mulan came out and it literally was life changing because there was this person of color who um, went and saved China. <laughs> so yeah, it was just incredible to see a hero of that sort of proportion that really spoke to me that I could see myself in. Not that I couldn't see myself in terms of other stories because I grew up absolutely loving fairy tales and out of all the Disney princesses, for example, I really identified with Belle because she just was out in her own world and always singing and always reading books and fantasizing about, you know, going to different worlds, which really appealed to me. But it was the idea that I could see myself represented as a character of the same sort of background um, was just wonderful. And I think that, you know, growing up, it was quite challenging at times to be a person who was from a group that wasn't sort of widely distributed in the UK at the time, whether it was hiding my packed lunches because they were a bit different from everyone else's mm -hmm. or, you know, people sort of, you know, making fun of my appearance. So having that representation and being able to see myself in, in characters meant a lot to me. So um, I think as I grew up and then, you know, started making art where I could see myself as all these different characters, it was sort of me encapsulating what I love about fairy tale and fantasy, but also being able to see the representation that I've always craved as a child. So that's probably more of a, a drawer, a drawer into this sort of realm that I'm creating on my grid rather than a theme. It's basically I just want to see myself in so many different lights and hope that someone who sees that will feel, wow, I'm represented as well um, because there's this random Chinese girl in Britain running around in these fairy tale dresses. Maybe I can do that too. Um, so yeah, not really a theme, but more of sort of a, a an eccentric hobby <laughs> gone wild. So yeah. I don't know. I think that's a great theme. Like <laughs> that sounds like yeah. a theme to me. Sounds good. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Good stuff. I'm glad. What yeah. is the costuming scene like where you are? Yeah, so I think it's absolutely incredible. I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily part of that scene at the moment. I would love to become part of that scene, but I haven't done that much in terms of costume creation. But what I've seen as a model, whether for other designers and for other photographers and so on, working with costumers and as someone who's looking to become part of the scene, there are some really talented people out there. I, for example, love working with Sammy of Mr. Mortimer's Wife. She makes these incredibly delicate, detailed, history-inspired tiaras and crowns that just take your breath away. And having worn so many of them, I literally cannot describe how versatile she is one minute she's making something Tudor inspired next minute it's like Queen Joseph you know Empress Josephine vibes um and you know then you've got her like Regency S collections she's just so talented and um I'm so grateful that she sometimes makes custom pieces for our shoots as well and there's also Meg from Alara Moon who creates these absolutely incredible historic gowns, whether they're Regency. She made a Regency gown that was Snow White inspired that I got to model and I was like, oh my goodness, I am just so loving this. 
and also she absolutely kills it with different periods so she made this incredible gown I think it was called the Heather gown that was inspired by the Tudor period and I got to do a few self portraits with that as well so yeah she's really incredible and very open to to thinking about costuming in a very sustainable way so she often uses fabrics that are just lying around and she just creates these spectacular pieces from them and also the fact that it's less wasteful as a result that's just very inspiring to me as someone who's kind of coming into this costuming um a scene without much budget I'm now sort of looking through my you know um attic <laughs> for things like old bed sheets and anything I can get my hands on and I'm like oh I could use this for lining oh I could use this for whatever and uh it's it's pioneers like her that kind of show you you can make stuff out of like literally anything so I really love that she's um, been a big influence on me and the way that I contacted her is that we wanted to work together on my self portrait I think another person you just cannot forget in the costuming scene that is an absolute, you know, um, absolute inspiration to me is Zach Pinsett. I mean, who doesn't know Zach Pinsett? He's um, just a genius in a million and one ways uh, with such decadent outfits and stunningly sharp attention to detail. The fact that these are all British costumers, it's just like it fills me with a lot of pride and it really inspires me. And uh, I think that, you know, the openness and the kindness that they've embraced me with means that I feel that I can try this too. So I think that because of the costuming period, uh, the costuming community in in Britain, being so open and kind at least in my experience has meant myself as a woman of color I feel that I'm, I'm I'm ready to dabble into it I haven't had any negative experiences yet and I hope that I won't but it's really it's really embracing so that's my experience so far well I mean I think that your page is proof that costuming doesn't have to be limited to like folks dressing up and going out to an event like costuming can be doing self-portraits and never interacting with anyone else if you don't want to like I think all <laughs> all costumers are valid in any way that they costume um for, for everything from like hall cosplays to to people doing self-portraiture of like fantastical things in their living room somehow and producing these like mind-blowing images that you're just like whoa I want to look like that <laughs> so I think I think maybe you don't have that much interaction with like the group of historical costumers that are in that area, but you're still definitely doing costuming, like for sure. No, I really appreciate that. And I think that I have so much gratitude for the American costuming community online for encouraging my growth, because although I might not be going actively out to the costuming events, what I found is a lot of the cheerleaders that I've experienced are from the states and the community um, that I've been welcomed by is very much international and online so even though I'm doing all my costuming in in uh, quotation marks in my in my living room with my backdrop I feel that I'm part of this wonderful narrative and this community and uh, it's it's been a wonderful journey for me to be able to even interact with you know um, people just messaging me online or reacting to my work and I remember Noel when you followed me on Instagram I always freaked out <laughs> so yeah I was like I oh, freaked out when you talked to me I was like oh <laughs> no. that chick's really good at what she does <laughs> yeah and, oh that's so kind and then when <laughs> you emailed me on behalf of yourself and Gigi I was like oh my goodness like costuming and color this is a big thing I remember watching Vivian from Fresh Vipperies mm -hmm. uh costuming and color and I was like I actually cannot believe that I'm being asked to be on this show so thank you so much I mean it really makes me feel seen and it really makes me feel like I'm just going to jump into this. What's the worst that can happen? We've got a group that like wants to see more and, you know, they're empowering me. And I feel that if there are haters out there, well, bring it on because I've got this wonderful community that's, you know, backing me. So I think that, you know, that sort of openness that you advocate both as um, women 
and both as people who are supporting people of colour, I think you're doing such an important thing because someone's going to watch these videos or, you know, someone like me who have watched these videos and now part of these videos really feel like we can do anything and it's because of that belief that you instill in others so I wanted to say thank you for that you are very welcome I think what Noelle said about all customers are valid um kind of makes me almost want to cry a little bit because I feel like we've talked to enough people on this show some of them don't believe they're customers even when we yeah. invite them to come on costuming and color yeah and just the fact that you also talked about the community. So all costuming is valid. All customers are valid. And you are all part of a community. And I think yeah. the pandemic has shown us that more than ever, mm. even though we may not know each other in person or go to a, an event or even live in the same geographical area, we're still a community and we can get to know each other virtually by social media and by things like this. And we want to know each other. We want to support each other. So I'm so happy to have you here because of that. Oh, thank you. And I'm really grateful to be here having this conversation with you both. So um, it's just really, really wonderful to learn from you guys and your experience as well, because just when you said those words about how everyone is valid, sometimes this isn't something that you necessarily think when you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, you know, I, I definitely can speak for myself. I don't know about like most circumstances but definitely a lot of people um, when they come from a minority have imposter syndrome for example so being in a situation where people are repeating these very simple concepts of costuming being accessible to everyone costuming being something that everyone can partake and have a voice in I think that that is very powerful because often we are our own worst enemies in doubting ourselves and then when we come across a situation where that one person may doubt ourselves we become you know engulfed in this sort of confirmation bias but the more we have that sort of counter narrative with people like you guys as pioneers of this inclusivity it just means that you're creating a domino effect of people who end up being instilled with a renewed sense of self-belief and they continue to persevere and you never know what they will create and inspire as a result of them being participants in this community or even communities that are global and part and parcel of these connections that you make by chance. So really well said, Gigi. Thank that you. That makes so my heart warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Also, anybody watching this, pay it forward. <laughs> Go out and be positive cheerleaders for people. Do Don't it. be mean, be awesome to people. Find something you like about their costume and say something awesome. And remember that costuming is costuming. And so we usually ask this question and I'm going to mm. ask it to you. Um, but don't feel like you need to be boxed into it. We usually ask cosplay historical or both just one word, but say more than one word. Tell us what label you, you fall under. Yeah. So I'm not really sure actually that I fall into either. I mean, I would love to do more historical cosplay, um, sorry, historical costuming, and I'd love to do more cosplay, but I think I sort of fall into my own sort of um, a group at the moment as sort of a dabbler or a hobbyist who's sort of finding her way into different sort of crafty projects and I would say that I'm sort of leaning towards a fairy tale aesthetic itself so for example I was so delighted when um, I sort of just decided to cobble together some tinfoil as you do put it on a mannequin wrap it around tape it with duct tape and then glue gun a whole heck load of feathers and I made two bodices one white and one black and so I'd created self-portraits based on sort of the white and black swan dichotomy and um, they got published in Gilded magazine and I even secured one of the covers which I was super proud of okay. but essentially that is a key example of how I sort of work I kind of get obsessed with sort of a sort of aesthetic in a sort of fairy tale space. And then I'm like, let's go, let's make something. So um, 
although I've sort of made a Regency gown and some corsets in the past, I wouldn't say that I am a historic costumer yet because I'm not exclusively making those or like pursuing those. I would love to get into that space and it's something that I'm hoping to get into more. Um, and, um, you know, after I took my first full costume to a ball, so I went to a Bridgerton secret cinema ball event. Oh, uh, those very are cool. Yeah, it was so yeah. cool. So I wore like a regent, my regency gown that I made going to that event. And I bought some vintage gloves and I put on a tiara and I was like really pleased. Um, I went to that and it was just so nice to have people come up to me and be like, wow, I love your costume. Where did you buy it from? And I was like, well, <laughs> I actually made this. And I was just so, so pleased. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I think I've got a new found sort of mission to make more and to follow those historic um, patterns and try and make it accurate. Because I noted that a lot of people kind of showed up at the ball with just like whatever they bought that was like sort of looked a bit Bridgerton-y or sort of like, um, you know, time period-esque. Um, but uh, I kind of actually bought like, a, I think it was a McCall's pattern. And I sat there like trying to figure it out and follow it as closely as possible. And it just made me feel like, wow, this is such a fun little challenge and it looked the part. And so I do really want to do more of that. So I'm hoping that at the moment, although people might, you know, try and uh, explain my uh, craftiness as just sort of, random obsessions from time to time. I like to think myself as a fantasy aesthetic costumer, but I would love to have a little offshoot from there to do more cost historic costuming because of my experience making my first Regency gown and a few corsets. I used for the corset, I did my first American Duchess pattern and I was really pleased. And I remember tagging her on my Instagram. She was like, well done. And I was like, Oh my gosh, fan garling, big time. And it's just that, you know, what you were saying, Noel, about, you know, being cheerleaders for people, you know, saying something you like about someone's costume. It really means that that little encouragement is fuel for the next project and fuel for that person to think, wow, I've got some skills that I can continue to refine and apply. So although this is a really long winded answer, especially because the, the question asks for one word, I would say, fantasy aesthetic costumer um, with uh, a renewed interest in creating more historic costumes. So hopefully next time you ask me, I will say that I am a historic costumer that does a bit of fairy tale aesthetic. So we'll see. No I think, pressure. I think you can do many <laughs> things. We are, a lot of us are many things. I do all of the things. There's no, there's no box that you have to sit in unless you want to in the past I've just bought a costume whether it's for Halloween or whatever but I'm hoping now that I've done my Regency sort of uh you know Georgian sort of gown um and went to that Bridgerton ball um I would love to kind of now kind of do my next event maybe go to a comic con in a costume that I've made and then I could call myself like a proper cosplayer which would be really cool too but basically have so many different hats on and just keep changing them up so yeah like why not why, yeah, not? why not yeah exactly I also have dreams of calling myself a cosplayer one day we'll see if they ever come true it's gonna oh. happen it's gonna happen <laughs> yeah, he's coming here next week and I have a sewing room oh, I'm just you. <laughs> that sounds amazing oh right. I can't wait to see it <laughs> I do want to know that as far as historical what time place or period is your favorite yeah so it's really hard to choose an answer for that but I would say most likely Renaissance Florence I absolutely love it for just generally in terms of my interests um so I love reading about all the different Italian families of the Renaissance whether they're the Sforza or the Medici and you know um how they really set the foundations for rediscovering the secrets and the the manuscripts from ancient antiquity so it's really um a period where there was so much artistic freedom beautiful gowns beautiful costuming and a lot of trade so lots of influences from all over the world mm -hmm. and I absolutely love the rich colors of fabric the over-the-top puffy sleeves I'm like why are we not 
you know, wearing over the top puffy sleeves today. Like this needs to be a thing everywhere. And also men in tights are just the best. Like, come on, you know, like I just love the aesthetic. I love the history behind it, all the stunning art from the period, the sort of period of change itself in terms of redefining what, you know, being Florentine and Italian meant. And you can't forget all the sort of interesting gossip and the feuds between the families it's just like it's like it's like a soap opera except with incredible costumes <laughs> so yes um that period is definitely one of my favorites and I'm actually reading a great book called the bookseller of Florence by Ross King highly recommend it's about all the sort of um uh, nobles or established individuals of Florence trying to hunt down all these amazing manuscripts and basically going on horseback to, you know, all sorts of corners of the, 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 the European continent to trace these back and bring them back to Florence to create a real center of learning. And uh, it's a really, really good book. So that period is just, just incredible in terms of how much diversity there is in terms of um, subject matter to explore and the costuming scenes. Oh my God. Um, if you've not watched the Medici's on Netflix, please do. It's not particularly accurate, but you know, it's it's so beautiful to look at. So highly recommend. So yeah. Agreed. You should um just just watch it so you can get to know the the way the city looks, the way the yes. people look, the names, because all of those things take you back to actual historic places. I approve this message with your favorite time period. I just came back from Florence. It was amazing. Yeah. I got to find, um, <clears throat> I went on like a, a, not a tour, but I met with a lady who helps me visit some very significant places in the life of Alessandra de' Medici, the first Duke of Florence, yes. who happened to be mixed race. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I had a great time there. So yeah, watch the Medici's, even though it's not super, super accurate with the costuming, yeah. <laughs> it'll give you a taste. Exactly. I think that's the thing. It's a great way to kind of, it's a gateway drug into like everything, Medici, Sforza, like, you know, it's, it's just incredible in terms of how much that time period really dictated the development of Europe and also how we kind of had a lot of innovation in science and how, you know, um, Italy kind of re reinterpreted its 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 role in the european continent and its identity so it's fascinating from so many different perspectives whether you love science whether you love costume whether you love um art whether you love um sort of uh basically everything so proper trash (laughs) sorry Soap opera trash. Yes, that too. <laughs> so yeah, I absolutely love, I love it. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, definitely that time period is, 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 is probably the top. I would say that close second would be ancient Greece. So, you know, the age of Pericles and the building of the Parthenon and the Peloponnesian Wars. I find that really fascinating as well, because who doesn't love a good Greek myth? So that's also a big favorite. Can you remind us what that book you mentioned in is? And yeah. is it um, fiction or nonfiction? It's nonfiction. It's the bookseller of Florence by Ross King. It's excellent. And it sort of uncovers some of the ways in which we now have access to certain texts because these, you know, um, really passionate individuals went to trace back to manuscripts that were copied through the ages that contain like the works of like Cicero or Aristotle or whatever, and uh, were able to kind of then, you know, reproduce them. I think there was this one incredible story about someone who ended up in um, one of the churches or abbeys in Switzerland, and they I think it was Switzerland, I can't remember, but basically the 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 people in who were like looking after these books, were like you can't take it away. So they literally spent like a huge number of weeks sitting there and copying it by hand so they could then bring it back to Florence. So it's full of stories like that. And it's just incredible how, you know, passionate people were in the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of learning to bring it back and uh, really contributed to this amazing you know, what we call the Renaissance in Florence. So that's amazing. All right. How did you start in costuming? 
So um, I would say the thing that started me in costuming is the fact that I bought a glue gun and everything just went a bit bonkers from there. Like my husband has literally had strong words with me when he just found that there were further things everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, there's like, there's feather pieces in the kitchen. There's feather pieces like under the sofas. You need to make sure you use the vacuum cleaner properly after you've done a whole bit of costuming. So essentially um, during the pandemic, I was doing these self portraits and I wanted to kind of create these different aesthetics. So I sort of figured out if I just get a glue gun, I can then see where I get essentially. Um, and I was trying to think of clever ways to make what I wanted to make so that they would pass what my friend calls the photo test. Mm -hmm. So I was like, in real life, you'd be like, I would not be caught dead wearing that. But in the photo, you can get away with it. So yeah. I started making things like costumes in terms of um, headpieces and feathered corsets. And then um, I was getting so much lovely feedback from people. Um, I started thinking maybe I can try and apply these problem solving skills to different mediums and start doing needle and thread and making costumes. Because when I was in school, when I was about uh, 14 to 16 I did what is known as a GCSE which is sort of a secondary school accreditation and um, I did something known as textiles which is just like a two-year course on how to do basic sewing and we made like a pillow and we made like a simple bag so I, I remember the basics of using a sewing machine so I was like you know what it's a pandemic I am going to buy myself a sewing machine. And so one thing um, led to another and I started reading about costumers and what they use and what they recommend. YouTube is a great resource. I discovered the goddess that is Sostein. And I was just like, she is just so incredible. She's so encouraging. She messaged me back when I totally fangirled um, and sent her a million messages about how much I love her. So next thing you knew, like when I found out that she was also a doctor and she does costuming in her like free time. And I was like, I'm a lawyer. She's also a mom. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, how is this possible? So I think that you know, the glue gun kind of started me in the sort of like, how do I use my hands to make stuff for my little self portraits to then what else is there and what's the next level? And then being able to see people like Sostein and all these costumers basically have no real like uh, accreditation of doing costuming. Um, you know, for example, I used to think that in order to make costumes, you need to have like formal training and go to like some costuming academy. You know, I, I've got a very sort of narrow uh, understanding about how it works in, in, in the community. And then I saw, wow, you could literally just pick this up and learn it and all use all these resources. So that's where I sort of then kind of went on the bandwagon following all these amazing Instagrammers and being inspired to try something else. So there we go. Yeah. I, I mean, you really literally just need a glue gun. <laughs> <laughs> and then next thing you know. I, I can't recommend that method, but yeah. it is a way to do it for sure. <laughs> A hundred percent. I mean, that yeah. glue gun was incredible. I did, I did upgrade the glue gun because I bought like the cheapest range glue gun. Oh yeah, and it was just getting blocked, and I was just getting so frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get like a slightly more expensive glue mm -hmm. gun. And oh my goodness, my life! You know, gluing those feathers because you do get like I have to say, you do get hand cramps yes. <laughs> with the glue guns if they're mm -hmm. not that that good um so you know from there I ended up actually even covering like a red dress with red feathers and it's crazy what you can actually do with very little yep. um, and um a bit of wild sense of curiosity so it's quite fun to kind of play around in one of my self-portraits my first self-portrait that I did with my husband helping me I actually made these little pistachio flowers so I just got a bunch of pistachios, glue gun them together and spray painted them gold and then like posed with them. And I think it really just made me think, wait, we can glue gun so many things. What else can we glue gun? And then it just went down this wild path of me glue gunning everything that I could find in the house. So, yeah. 
So question, and yes. you, to, you can tell us whether it was with a glue gun or not. Yes. What is your favorite completed project? Well, this was no glue gun whatsoever to my husband's delight because glue guns can be very messy and he can hear my uh, outbursts of very, very sweary words when I burn myself. <laughs> I always keep like a bowl of water, top tip, mm -hmm. keep a bowl of water by your side <laughs> so that if you burn your fingers, you can, you know, dip them in, do, do your proper light burns. <laughs> there burns. are also these little like... Remedies finger condoms Ooh. that you can get that are like right. they're made to reduce like reduce heat on you wow. and those are amazing if you're gonna do glue gun stuff you just put one on this finger and one on this finger and then whatever you're holding yes it's good try it they're made out of silicone or whatever that is awesome you see this is what costuming and color is all about all these really important tips next thing i'm going to search for are finger condoms <laughs> if you can help me find, figure out the right name for these i think they're called great. finger cots <laughs> i just refuse to call them that because everyone oh. i just imagine like a sleeping situation and not like a it's a condom <laughs> <laughs> right? but do you actually search that i'm just wondering if i if i if i google like you know, finger condoms, and then no, don't do all that. I really need no. is, is they search on. <laughs> Got it. Okay, but yeah, yeah, little protectors, heat protectors for fingers. Yeah, okay. look up he uh, heat resistant finger cots. Finger cots. Okay, yes. that is brilliant. Okay, mm -hmm. no, that's so helpful because I was literally like every few minutes, like ow, swear word, ow, swear <laughs> word. My husband's like. <laughs> why do you do this to yourself and I'm yeah. like I have to be the swan okay he just does not get it <laughs> so but you know the things you do for art as they say and then you can run around the house and ask your husband where the, your finger condoms are and he'll get very confused <laughs> yes. and it'll be very fun for you absolutely 100% honestly one of the best things about having like um a significant other is the fact that you can confuse <laughs> all the time pick up a new hobby yes yes uh -huh. so yeah it, it, it is good fun but yeah so like the um my favorite so far is the gown that I wore to the Bridgerton ball just because it's the first like complete um outfit that I created and the biggest flex for me that I was very very pleased with is that someone came up to me and said that you know they really liked my gown and I also complimented their gown because it looked fantastic and they told me that they had made it themselves and that they in their normal lives does wedding gowns and I was like oh my goodness someone who does this as a profession thought that my gown was like you know that, that it was half decent and I was like yes so I was really pleased about that and also because I wore it to an event I you know spun in it I posed in photos for like random people who came up to us when we were walking to the event who thought we were just like actors walking around and I was like oh my goodness this is so exciting I feel like I'm in some sort of reenactment or something like that and that experience just made me feel so pleased because firstly the gown did not disintegrate I didn't end up like I don't know losing the skirt or like a sleeve falling off so I was really pleased that it kept, got kept together like you have to think about it like from when I started off with a glue gun like just you know gluing <laughs> gluing feathers to tin foil to actually wearing an outfit that looks like okay um to the maybe the untrained eye and actually to a trained eye which was really a big compliment and the fact that it stayed in one piece from the beginning of the day to the end of the evening so I was really happy with that and also because I was able to add my own little touches to it in terms of choosing the trim. I ordered from Etsy um, like a little bit of a, an embellishment um, just for the Empire Waist. And I was really pleased because I was like, oh, I kind of customized it to my own tastes. So I was really, really pleased with it. And it really kind of gave me confidence to think I can do more of this stuff in future. So probably my favorite because it was a bit of a milestone for me if that makes sense totally most people's favorite costume is the one that they made yeah. first that they walked out the door in and it stayed and it was good so yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. it's how it made me feel mm -hmm. and the fact that you know I felt confident in it and I felt that all those little things I couldn't be bothered to do but I did do I felt very pleased about it because there was one point where I had, you know, really been pleased about putting it all together, but that I put on the sleeve a bit wonky and I was like, 
do you think people will notice should I actually take this out thread by thread it will take me a long time and it will require all my patience not to just rip it off I'm going to take every thread very slowly out of the sockets and then re-sew it and I did so I was really pleased because then when I had the finished product the sleeves did not look wonky um and I was just really pleased that it gave me such a good lesson about patience and doing things over even if they're really painful so mm -hmm. been there it's a good journey for me <laughs> yeah I actually had to take it out twice because the the first time I put it the wrong way and I only noticed and like literally after I had sewed it in and I was like I cannot be like this the uh -huh. entire evening and so there. one was perfect the other one was like literally the whole was this way and I was like yeah so then the second time I did it it was wonky and I was like well it was better than the first time but I'm so glad that I did it like the second time and so third time lucky in terms of the first, third attempt but the second time of like pulling out the threads even mm -hmm. though I was so upset I'm so glad because it really taught me the idea that costuming isn't just getting everything perfect in, in every go it's yeah. about you know taking your time problem solving making mistakes and learning from it I Absolutely. don't like this <clears throat> I don't like this lesson I want to <laughs> I I just want you to tell me how to do it right the first time. And then I want to do it that way and be done. This is yeah. why I'm having a problem with costuming mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I think of that as failure. Mm -hmm. And the more I talk to costumers like yourself, Yenzi, I hear I had to do it over again. And so maybe this is a life lesson. Maybe this is, uh, the, the, you know, the universe trying to tell me <laughs> I need to learn <laughs> that Aww. making mistakes is not failure. Yeah, yep. no, I totally agree. And one of the things that I've actually learned from being a lawyer that I try to apply to my hobbies is that every mistake is a great lesson because one, it reinforces the opportunity to make a decision that's different from the original decision that was a mistake. For example, the next time I put a sleeve on, I'll really think about it before just like oh, I'm just gonna put this through the sewing machine it was great you know match and based it at that point and then you know what I mean um because I'm gonna check myself every time I put a sleeve in and the fact that I made it twice has really reinforced it so that whenever I see a sleeve I mean I do get a bit of like anxiety when I see a sleeve now because I'm like oh no this could happen but it's it's basically given me the confidence that I've remedied it when it went wrong which which means that if I do make mistakes in the future, I know that it's not the end of the world, which will mean that I'll have a calm mind to kind of remedy it properly. Because initially I was just so upset because I was like, oh my gosh, the fabric is going to rip. Like it's going to really kind of not have any more give because I've already picked it out once. I'm going to pick it out a second time and it was fine and it stayed. So it also taught me a bit about, you know, the fabric strength and how I was working with the particular fabric that I was. So, you know, you learn so many different things, which then ingrain into your memory so much better than if you just read it experience is the best teacher and mistakes like amplify those lessons so I think it's painful to acknowledge because it's so great when things go smoothly but I think because of all those mistakes and because I managed to go to that ball wearing something that I was proud of it meant that those mistakes almost forged me into someone who felt that even though there were these obstacles you know I, I, I brought the ring to Mordor, you know, I literally chucked it in the volcano and I was so proud that I did it. You know what I mean? It's hard, but th those hard little obstacles made me feel even prouder at the end because I went on a journey rather than smooth sailing. So yeah, it's a hard lesson that I've learned not only in the costuming world, but you know, my professional career. But I think it's one of those things that in a society that often kind of makes things look easy you think that you know someone is good at something if they're polished and they have a natural talent and actually I think that what we don't realize is all the the, the challenges and the failures that underlie that is what almost filters people from the people who 
retain their resilience to keep going and because they keep going that's how they learn and refine and refine and refine and then end up where they are and I think that it's such an amazing story of how people um, discover things about themselves because I never thought that I was the type of person to have patience to unpick a sleeve twice because I was like you know Yinzi like maybe you should just give up costuming's not for you you know you're a glue gun person but I was like no I, I I am a glue gun person but I can also be a costuming person and so for me it was a real revelation because I thought okay I put the sleeve upside down which is pretty embarrassing but I got over that and I managed to put it the right side up it was just a bit wonky but despite that wonkiness I still then re-picked it another time and I feel really proud that I did that because it made me realize how important it was to me and that sort of solidification of the, that fact made me feel like I have like you know earned my right to say that this costume was you know, an achievement because of those mistakes. So that's that's my 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 two cents in in that that sort of framework. It's both torn and polished. Exactly, torn many times. I love that yes. new new meaning to my 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 uh, handle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the pro tip on the sleeves is to hand base them. It sounds like it's a horrible idea. It's really not. Just hand base real loosely your sleeve in first. Mm -hmm. Try it on, and you'll see if it's upside down or not. That is so good. And then those stitches are way easier to pick out and way faster. Mm -hmm. And then you just do that until it's right. And then, I mean, I still, I actually found that hand installing the sleeve is, is better than the machine. Like it somehow always comes out slightly better. The machine's kind of rough to get all that stuff. In, yeah. You know, it's a curve and yeah, just do it by hand. <laughs> no, I think that that's a brilliant idea. And also I think that I realized in the beginning stages of the costume, I just didn't want to hand base stuff. Mm -hmm, and yeah. I realized that was another mistake I learned from. Hand basting is like the ultimate hack. Mm -hmm. Like if you just hand, if you just take a little bit of time to hand base, put Pirates of the Caribbean on, it's all good. Uh -huh, yep. It's all cushy. You then go and you do the hand basting. It will make your life so much easier. But if you do skip that step, you will be unpicking and unpicking. So these are really good like things to kind of reinforce and learn from. And I think that's the wonderful thing is that if you've got mistakes that you can learn from and a community who can tell you about their mistakes and the things that they use to avoid mistakes, basically, it's not just your own mistakes that are making you a better costumer, it's other people's mistakes. Yes. So share, share, share. <laughs> so, yeah. I learned this hand basting thing because I put the sleeves into Iron Man eight times. Oh, no. Eight. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, eight is a lucky number in Chinese culture. It is. So, you know, <laughs> lucky eight. So, uh -huh. you know, that is a great tip. And um, I think it's one of those things that when you do have a community and people are encouraging each other and exchanging ideas, it really accelerates your growth. And the only reason there's so many good tips out there is because other people are also making mistakes. And then this wonderful pool of mistakes is just ensuring that you get to learn from yourself and others. So, yeah. yeah. All right. I think you've told us, but I want to hear more about her. Who's your costumer crush? Yeah, so I have lots of costumer crushes, but yes, you are very right. Uh, one of my ultimate costuming crushes is Sostine, um, or Christine, and she's just an absolute goddess to me. I think because as an Asian person, it was just so empowering to see someone of my background in sort of a parallel universe in a way, um, because she's a doctor who lives in the States. And she's, I think she's first generation Korean. Yes. Um, and I'm second generation Chinese in the UK. Well, she or was born in Korea. Exactly. So yeah, she's yeah. first generation immigrant, right? Yeah, yeah. And so like just being able to hear about her story and the challenges that she's faced, as well as the challenges she continues to face, as well as everything that she does 
to such an incredible level in terms of her costumes, her detailing, her innovation, her, um, you know, real advocacy for costuming as an inclusive community on top of what she does in her normal life, being an incredible doctor, being a mum. I think that, you know, to actually see her as this full person who is so brilliant at what she does, but also is a full person who um, shares her vulnerability, who reaches out to people and who gives back to the community. I think it just is so empowering for me. And she also showed me that you don't have to define yourself by your profession. I mean, she might be a doctor, but she creates these costumes. She also, you know, is very involved in doll making as well. And she plays games, she does cosplay, she does so many different things. And that's what life's about. It's about exploring everything that you enjoy and makes you you. And even if it's foreign or different from, anything that people have seen before you know you're writing your own story you're writing your own narrative and that's exactly what she does and it's really inspired me to do the same and really pursue everything that I've always dreamed of pursuing but my self-doubt just held me back so to see her do these things and you know as an Asian woman who you know has faced certain prejudices even with her current you know, YouTube channel. She's been very open about sharing comments she's received and very open about showing the lack of inclusivity that some people have shown her. It's incredible that she's resilient and she's still creating this content and she's showing people, you can deny me a space, but um, ultimately I am making my space and I am being seen and I am being heard and people will value my voice, made me think that she's created a space not only for herself, but also for people like me. So I think that from a personal level, although I admire so many different costumers because there's so much talent out there, I think what she's done for a lot of you know Asian women like myself, and the fact that I can stand on her shoulders means that she really has occupied a real um, amount of respect in my journey. And, uh, you know, to see her support and to see her um, real um, advocacy for that diversity She's always sharing, for example, other costumers work. She shared my work a few times. She just stays so humble and down to earth. It's a real, she's a real role model for me, basically. So yes, apologies for this long monologue, but I just absolutely love what she represents and how she's shown herself to be such a wonderful and powerful voice for change and inclusivity. You are not the first person to do this on this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't imagine so. <laughs> yeah. Lots of lots of people are super into Christine, and I personally am in also super into Christine. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I definitely um can imagine so. She is really amazing. So yeah. Yeah. I have a question about your entertainment routine. What do you listen to or um what do you have on the TV or on the radio or on your MP3 player? People don't have those anymore. Hold on. <clears throat> no, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> what is your entertainment routine for sewing and crafting? So I would say I often have Folklore by Taylor Swift on repeat or the Medici soundtrack. Sorry, I have a bit of an obsession with Medici's by Paolo Buonamino, um, the composer on repeat. And um, occasionally I have Classic FM, which is a station in the UK that plays classical music and has really wholesome hosts that I absolutely love with callers who call in requesting their favorite classical music pieces. It's amazing. I love it. It's super wholesome. So I listen to those and just enjoy and do my costuming that way. Or I often um, uh, enjoy just watching movies that I've watched so many times. If I miss certain scenes, it's not a big deal. And one of my favorites is 
guilty pleasure pirates of the caribbean i really want to be a pirate that sort of like you know runs along broken masts with a sword <laughs> so yes i absolutely love you know the music i love the aesthetic i love the costumes so it's a good little um inspiration set that i have running in the background when i'm when i'm sewing or whatever but yeah movies like that are just really great to dip in and dip it out of uh, while i'm doing the costuming who inspires you so yeah, this is going to be a really long, long list of people because there's so many people who have been instrumental to my growth and my path. So um, I would say that there are lots of inspirations for different reasons. And I would say that in a creative sense, I have to give a lot of credit to the incredible photographers and self-portrait artists and sometimes models, Bella Kotak and Lillian Liu. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but their work is absolutely insane. And um, they are also co-founders of Enchanted Asian Day, which is um, a movement that we started to celebrate Asian creators. So we actually were inspired by Black Fay Day, which is an incredible movement that celebrates Black creators of the sort of fairy tale fantasy space. And we wanted to do something similar for the Asian community because we were we felt that there was a lot of um, representation that was quite tokenistic in you know a lot of sci-fi, a lot of fantasy, even though it drew a lot from Asian culture. And in addition to that, in reaction to a lot of the anti-Asian hate that we were seeing as a result of the COVID pandemic. So I would definitely say that they've inspired me with their advocacy in that respect and their partnership in starting Enchanted Asian Day. But they're also really wonderful artists and photographers. And not only are they really fun, down to earth and very humble people, but they also show you that you can create magic in the most random locations, whether it's just a bush in the neighbor's garden, you know, a, a, a tree on the motorway, you know, just basically seeing how they can envisage amazing piece of work, create a concept that takes you away, whisks you to these ethereal realms, but they just found a tiny bush in the yeah. middle of nowhere yeah. as a starting point. It really has influenced the way I create as well, because, you know, I don't necessarily have budget for things. Um, it means that I have to think about being crafty, think about being resourceful. And because I've seen these wonderful women in action as a model, I've sort of like taken, taken their technique in, in the same light and how I do things. So I would definitely say those individuals. If, oh, yeah, you have in, if you have Instagram people, go check out the hashtags for Enchanted Asian Day and Black Fay Day. They're lit. Like I'm telling you, they're awesome. And if you happen to be Asian or Black, please participate because like more. Yeah, it's awesome. Really well said. Thanks so much, Noelle. And, and it was amazing because in the latest issue of Enchanted Living magazine, I don't know if you guys know Enchanted like, mag Living magazine, but <laughs> their handle is um, Fairy Magazine on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fairy spelled F A E R I E. Um, we actually collaborated on that issue and we interviewed the founder of um, Black Fay Day, Jasmine, for that issue. And we also um, had our pieces on show and we actually showcased uh, uh, an applicant for a competition for um, a one page spread in the magazine. So it was really exciting to be part of that. So the fact that people, so many people have embraced it has really created a safe space for people that look like me or people from other Asian backgrounds or people from black backgrounds. And I hope that that continues and that momentum grows because creating the representation that one wishes to see more of, if we can just continue to push and push, you never know where that's going to reach, you know, that little kid that's always dreamed of being a fairy or, you know, that, that, that uh, individual who feels that maybe they're not welcome in a particular space. What we're trying to do with Enchanted Asian Day is essentially what you guys are doing with costuming and colour. So um, I think it's really nice to see all these different movements and different initiatives pop out. In, in terms of inspirations, though, I do actually have a few more I wanted to mention, if that's all right. So I'm also really inspired by my friend Nua Imagery. She is 
very much a renaissance woman and she sort of taught me the biggest lesson which is why don't you just give everything that you want to give a try a try and um, she's insanely talented if you actually look at her work she can pretty much do everything under the sun she does self-portraiture costuming photography modeling she also plays the piano and the harp and it makes me feel that I can just in experiment and try different things so she's definitely a personal inspiration for me we also rock it out all the time to Disney soundtrack so it's fantastic when we shoot and uh, what my other inspirations would definitely be my collaborators who are incredible at their own respective crafts so whether it's Nettie who is um, Net Gray on Instagram N-E-T-T-G-R-A she is incredible at hair her work defies gravity. She is an architect of hair. Absolutely incredible, the versatility in which she sees the potential of hair and creativity within a theme. And also Minaz, who does spectacular makeup, really ethereal, eye-popping, colourful and multifaceted makeup. She's X-M-I-N-Z-I on Instagram. And of course, my lovely Sammy of Mr. Mortimer's wife, who is a costumer of um, her fantastic tiaras and crowns. So the reason why these individuals really inspire me is because I can see the passion that they have when they're creating these objects. And that passion, even though we're doing a different component of a photo shoot when we get together, it's so addictive and it's so infectious. And it really shows you that when you're in, in your element and when you find something that you love, the sky is the limit and when you're around people who love what they do and you're part of that team the sort of enthusiasm just continues to push through and you create things that you didn't think were possible so it really inspires me when I get to work with them what or who are you grateful for Yes, yeah, so I would definitely say I'm really grateful for my husband, um, not only for his patience, but all my glue gunning and uh, all the feathers <laughs> flying around everywhere, um, as well as like threads, you know, poking out from every single angle. He's a bit of a clean freak. And uh, let's just say one of his favorite hobbies is <laughs> hoovering the house. So when he sees all these feathers everywhere, here he goes with the hoover, making sure that everything is as clean as it was before I started unleashing hell upon our humble abode. Um, because our home is very small it's a bit of our little hobbit hole in Hertfordshire if you would call it Hertfordshire but Hertfordshire I do feel a bit like a hobbit sometimes so the reason why he's really inspiring to me and who I, why I'm really grateful for is that he's really instilled me with a sense of self-belief beyond my wildest dreams because he has taught me that I can do anything I put my mind to for example I did not swim and I did not know how to ride a bike as a child like I just did not know how to do those things and even though I tried to learn how to swim at school just never really clicked because I was so scared and I was never very physical so I was always that kid that got picked last at every team Aww. school so I was like twiddling my thumbs and it, you know suddenly my friend would be chosen as captain I'd be like oh maybe my friend will pick me like second to last no I still <laughs> was last so uh for my husband to kind of um you know uh, then take me on is almost a bit of a project he taught me how to um, ride a bike he taught me how to swim and uh, he was very patient in like showing me all these beautiful sights around England and you know you know hiking with me and it just gave me so much confidence because as a kid you know I always saw myself as just the bookworm but fantasized about being those characters in all those different books you know instead of being those main characters in those books I'd be reading about them but ever since my husband came into my life and dragged me into all these different activities I have now become so shocked about how far I've come so um, basically I now do fencing 
I sail. So I learned how to sail someone who, who used to, you know, not know how to swim. I now can sail. So that's quite exciting. I've tried historic martial arts and uh, I know how to canter on a horse. So it's just really wonderful because he gave me the gift of, you know, not only um, the ability to kind of give things a try because he really believed that if I wanted to do something, he would help me in my own time learn how to do these things. He's also instilled in me um, an appreciation for having good health. And I think, you know, the pandemic really put that into perspective. Your health is so important. So um, the fact that now I'm like going out and enjoying fresh air and, you know, doing all these different sports, it's been really wonderful that he's given me that gift because he's a very physical person and I never was. So it's really nice that he kind of influenced me in that way. And hopefully I've influenced him in other ways that are nice too so it's more reciprocal <laughs> you can buy him a glue gun for christmas sorry you can buy him a glue gun for christmas <laughs> yes i could maybe i could even put him to work once he has that glue gun <laughs> he can do the back of my feather corsets while i do the yeah, front exactly. <laughs> yes absolutely and then he can hoover which is brilliant <laughs> so yes that's the best um, part <laughs> yeah that's the best part no he's he's really wonderful and uh also he's got a very um infectious sense of humor so he always makes me laugh all the time and also even though and this is why I know he's a keeper even though he absolutely hates modeling he has actually modeled a few times with me to oh. make me happy and he will give up like a week like a weekend day to drive me to some of my shoots because sometimes the shoots are like in remote locations and beautiful historic houses so he's basically the person that has really kind of opened new doors in my life but also the things that I'm passionate about whether it's like creating an absolute mess in our little hobbit hole or like ensuring that I can get to that shoot that's like I don't know, a few hours away, he is there backing me. So he really, he doesn't understand why I do these things, but boy, does he support me in doing these oh, things. That's and I think that's why I'm really grateful for him. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite inspirational quote? And if so, who is it by? Yeah, so one of my favorite inspirational quotes is for I, by uh, Maya Angelou. She's always got the best quotes, hasn't she? She's just a wonderful, wonderfully inspiring um, poet and writer of all sorts. And um, the quote that I love is, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that, you know, to what you guys are doing, as well like it's real credit to what you guys are doing is that there really is no substitute for kindness there is really no substitute for encouragement you know how you make someone feel about their journey about their path about anything to be honest it can go a long way and also ensure that you know, a trajectory that they thought that wasn't for them, it creates a safe space and you never know where that ends up leading. So I think it's something that I don't necessarily always get right in terms of making sure that I am empathetic and I can make people feel, um, you know, well-respected and seen and heard, but it's definitely something that I aspire to do. And I think that, you know, what's wonderful is so many people have done that for me and I wouldn't be as fulfilled either in costuming or fairy tale and fantasy modeling and self-portraiture hadn't those people given me that encouragement because I remember those feelings and that just kind of encapsulates so much self-belief. Um, and, you know, as I spoke to you ladies earlier, in a position where I had made my gown and went to the Bridgerton ball, the fact that someone came up to me and said, your gown looks fantastic. I just felt so happy and I felt so proud. And I'm gonna hold on to that because it was my very first gown. So I would say that that quote is very resonant with a lot of things that I do in terms of how I've been encouraged by others. If you could give new customers one piece of advice, what would it be? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I'm a new, I consider myself a bit of a new costumer myself. So, you know, in a way, maybe my initial experiences will be useful to people who are just giving it a go to. And I think that it comes to the point that we were discussing earlier, which is failure provides um, the best lessons in your journey. And um, essentially, those lessons will make you more resilient. And those failures will also make you a better problem solver as you continue in your journey. Because even though a costume is the finished product, when you look at the big picture, actually, it's the whole journey of the costume that is something that you can reflect on and feel proud about. So every single piece of thread, every bit of glue gardening that you do, it is what makes those different constituent parts of that costume. It's all pieces of a puzzle that fit together. And if you end up working on one piece of puzzle because you can't fix it up properly, or you can't work out how it all comes together, you will have to work really hard to kind of understand that and you will really refine your knowledge about how how to address that issue. So whether it's the great tip from Noel about basting, <laughs> basting those sleeves, if you want to get them on, like, right, or whether it's just the idea that you need to kind of uh, unpick a sleeve, as I mentioned before, multiple times to figure out how it actually fits on, it will be in a, you will be in a better position to do it the next time. And I think that not carrying away from the fact that you will make mistakes is something that I have learned the hard way. But when I see the finished product and I remember and I see all those mistakes and challenges, I know that it would not have ended up the way that it ended up without all of those mistakes because it just meant that I had to be more patient and more resilient and more innovative in making sure that they worked out in the end. Yeah. Fixing your mistakes at the time that they happen is so much better and easier than a regretting the thing that you made or hating it subtly in your head while you're having to wear it or having to take the thing apart later because you realize you really should have done the fix then don't do that later. It's so much more work. A hundred percent. And I couldn't have said it better myself. It's the fact that everything that you do leading up to the final piece, because everything is about, you know, um, problem solving, right? So if you kind of mess up one bit, but then you think, ah, oh, you know, it's fine. I'll just move on to the very end. Sometimes you might get away with it. Sometimes you might not. But if you address that failure and you address that mistake early on, um, you know, you'll be able to learn for next time. And it really helps refine your understanding of how all the constituent pieces come together. Yeah, for sure. All right. If you have a closing message of inclusion or equity that you'd like to send out, we would love to make space for that. Oh, that's very kind. So I think it really is a, a summary that I want to allude to in my message, which is that um, what we discussed earlier, that in spaces where there aren't many people that look like you, it can be quite intimidating. So I think that if one has influence, like you ladies have done for me so I really appreciate it and the ability to help someone grow or empower their voice consider using that and it, you really never know where it will lead that other person so you know just kind of paying homage again to for example Sostine or Christine the fact that she was so encouraging in my journey for creativity really resonated with me and it made me feel seen and heard and it just meant that I had more energy to push on and continue to make my own voice heard because people are listening and people are seeing me. So given these pieces of encouragement that I got from others for myself portraits in the fairy tale fantasy space and also one another group called the Bella Kotak Facebook group you should definitely check it out it's the fairy tales and fantasy with Bella Kotak I really did feel that people were looking at my work giving feedback saying just like one thing that they liked it made me feel that my voice deserves to be heard and that, you know, there is a space for me. So I think creating that space, encouraging people to come into it is so powerful. And what 
costuming and color stands for is exactly that. If you have a situation where you can just give someone the chance to connect on a, a personal level where they feel that their work has moved you in a certain way or that work has impressed you in a certain way, that is something that could be really formative in their journeys. Well said. Um, I have an addition to that for the white people that are watching this. I mean, we get intimidated too, obviously. We all get imposter syndrome. But please recognize that the people of color around you are having this feeling and you have the opportunity to make this easier for them. And you have the opportunity to give them that kind word, invite them to hang out with your group, invite them to have tea with you, invite them at an event to stand with you and hang out and get to know you a little bit better. You don't even understand the difference that that can make. You have the power to do that and to make someone feel comfortable and included and wanted, you should take that power and use it. No, that's really well said. And actually, I think that, you know, some of my greatest supporters are, you know, white people who jumped in to share my work or reach out to collaborate. And, you know, I think it's just so wonderful because, it really makes me feel like that there's a sense of community and it in in a way it doesn't matter if I come from a different background what binds us is our love of getting creative rolling up our sleeves and spending a day creating something and I think that that really is a wonderful connecting point and you can learn so much from you know someone that you might not have reached out to were it not for a bit of bravery so yeah. you know I think that what's the worst that can happen if you reach out to someone you know it doesn't work out that's fine but what's the best that could happen right. I mean the p potential for really great things you you know literally could be exponential and I can definitely say that for so many of my experiences whether it was my first photo shoot uh, wearing um, Mr Mortimer's wife's tiaras and we've become long-standing collaborators and I am wearing one of her tiaras on the cover page of this month's issue of Enchanted Living magazine. So it's just wonderful to know that she was there at the very beginning of my journey in this space and I consider her such a great friend and it's wonderful because not only will you be encouraging someone and helping someone along their way, you might also grow with them and create a deep and wonderful friendship. Absolutely. Wow. So I wanted to say that was lovely. It was wonderful having you here. Thank you for coming and allowing us to get to know you a little better today. Also, thank you to our viewers for joining us. Um, we will leave Yenzi's information below for you to go follow her on all of her platforms. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't. You can ring that bell if you wanna know whenever we have a new video out. If you have a customer of color that you think we should interview, including your own self, please use the form that we insert in the description down below. We do go through that to uh, check out who we should be talking to. Make sure to leave a little love for Yin Z in the comments below and you guys stay safe out there. Bye guys. Thank you, bye. Thank you.